The last speaker now is Agustin Menendez, Principle of Proportionality and Issue of Fundamental Rights for European uh, Law. Thanks a lot. I'm very honored to be to have been invited to be here today. I'm very impressed by the organization. I'm very impressed by the endurance of the audience. But I will try not to test it too much because I realize that I have the accidental situation of being the last one of a very long day. Uh, so I think, unfortunately, it would be more a question of rhetorics in a way that of practical reason, in only, only in order to keep you um, uh, awake in many ways. At the same time, I feel, how to put it, uh, impressed in many ways for the reason that this is a very special workshop in many ways and because uh, this is around Professor Alexi, which, uh, who uh, I regard as one of the key figures in many ways in legal theory and for my own uh, formation to, to, to the extent that this is uh, prevalent. And I come here with arguments that probably are critical and perhaps are more critical in the way that uh, Leo was pointing to, to the Alexians regarding European law. Uh, if they are critical, they are critical in the spirit of, uh, of having learned, in a way, the points, I hope, from Alexi, in a way. But what is the topic? Because the question here, this is interesting, and, and, and this is the purpose of my introductory remarks. We have been moving, in a way, between positive law and morality. And European fundamental rights, the fundamental rights of the European Union, remain somehow in between. They were totally in between when, as uh, Carlo was reminding us, the European Court of Justice found them uh, in the common constitutional tradition of the member states, which was positive law, but at the same time, it was a plurality of positive laws that then has to be somehow harmonized or made into concrete positive law, which of course gave room to the European Court of Justice not to follow exactly positive law, because there are several positive laws and then you choose, in a way, which to pick up. And then this remained the case with the proclamation of the Charter of Fundamental Rights for the simple reason that until the Treaty of Lisbon entering into force, it was only a restatement, if we can borrow the American term, it was a restatement of the rights. It was not authoritative as having been decided, positivized, by the European legislator so to say. And it remains so today because playing the lawyer for a second, and I will try to play it several times but only in bits, uh, is Article 6.2 of the Treaty of the European Union which establishes that uh, not only the Charter is part of the primary law of the European Union but also the European Union abides by the European Convention of Human Rights and by the common constitutional traditions of the member states of fundamental rights. So this original strange thing that is the common constitutional tradition from the point of view of positive law, because it's a plurality of positive laws that are affirmed at the same time, so to say, remains the case. So in this in-between, what happens when you start applying, in a way, proportionality to it? When do you start reasoning with the help of proportionality to it? And I think there are two things that I will be coming at the end. Uh, I think it says to us about the limits of proportionality. Hmm? Uh, and I think um, I will make the argument of trying to think proportionality not as a legitimizing device, and I think many Alexians are into confusing, and with full respect, I sense some of these things when our distinct uh, colleague and, and, and justice in Estonia was referring today, uh, there is this element of a legitimizing device. If you follow proportionality, then the decision will be correct. I don't agree. And moreover, I think the proper use of proportionality is the opposite. is to reveal 
what are the points at which courts are taking certain decisions. And in this sense, it brings order, but it also reveals when discretion is being exerted and avoids arbitrariness. I come back to that. The second question that I will not have uh, proper time in order to deal, but I will only refer to, is what kind of law, following the way, in a very peculiar way, the question that is posed in the, uh, in the um, title of the workshop, what kind of law is EU law? Because I think on that we have clearly to go beyond a kind of simplistic positive law understanding, which is not probably uh, at all of the classics, so to say, of positive law, and then there are different types of positive law. What kind of law and what kind of state the European Union is. To do that, very briefly, because I think I have something like 23 minutes left, uh, is to do in three steps. One is to put the question, the other is to do the criticism of the court, and the third is to go back to the first two questions. So what is, in a way, the question, where does it come from? What is the kind of problem that I'm dealing with? And the problem has to do with European legal scholarship, which has tended to assume or to accept two claims that implicitly or explicitly the European Court of Justice has made. And these two claims are that European Union law is constitutional law in the same way as national constitutional law is constitutional law, and that the European Court of Justice is a constitutional court reviewing the constitutionality of national law by reference to a canon of constitutionality, to a jarstick of constitutionality. I think this means, this, sorry, this entails a, an acceptance that the European Court of Justice uses the same tools of trade as national constitutional courts. And this is reflected on the fact that they are using, I repeat, a jarstick, and then the conflicts between rights are adjudicated on the basis of proportionality. So this would mean that we could immediately, in a way, apply the same kind of theoretical tools in order to reconstruct uh, European constitutional law, and implicitly that we should bring or give to European constitutional law the same benefit of doubt as we give to national constitutional law and to national constitutional courts. My claim that I now try to justify why is that this is not correct. And this is not correct on the basis of the two assumptions being open to be criticized. The first is that there is a canon of constitutionality, but it's very different, and we are learning by the day, in a way, with many decisions coming, that is not only very different, but very problematic in reference to national democratic constitutional law. And the second is that the way in which the European Court of Justice uses proportionality only in appearance is the same as national constitutional courts. This is a case of false friends. They look similar, they are not. Why is this so? The canon of constitutionality. The canon of constitutionality apparently is the same as the national one. The European Court of Justice talks about fundamental rights and talks a lot about fundamental rights. But if you start to scratch, there are at least two, and there is an element of dualism here, two different sets of fundamental legal positions according to European Court of Justice. One is fundamental rights that roughly we can say are contained in the Charter, and the other is economic freedoms. And they developed, and I cannot go into detail there, but they developed at the same point of time, that is the 70s. Hmm? They came of age, in a way, in the 70s. The problem here is that in actual practice, the European Court of Justice undertakes constitutional review of national laws. They are far and between the number of cases in which European laws have been declared unconstitutional or have been aggressively, so to say, interpreted in terms of changing, in a way, the meaning that they have. So the real need, in a way, is regarding the review of national laws. But regarding national laws, the standard of review is economic freedoms understood basically as subjective rights and competition understood as a collective good, I would argue. Fundamental rights, as Carlo was pointing to, are used as stoppers of counter-arguments justifying the breach 
of fundamental rights if they are used. And in a way, the Court of Justice has developed its jurisprudence in a functional way. The functional way being preventing the possibility of fundamental rights being mobilized in order to justify not complying with European law. Now, this means that the canon of constitutionality that the European Court of Justice de facto applies is economic freedoms. Well, there are four arguments that, as a lawyer, I can make playing the lawyer again, uh, that are deeply problematic. The first is that economic freedoms are, let's be clear about it, basically another way of talking about private property and entrepreneurial freedom. But private property in the national constitutional traditions is not in all of them. I would say, at least until enlargement, clearly it was not in most of them a fundamental right. It's a constitutional right, but it's not necessarily a <coughs> fundamental right. So there is this a first problem, if fundamental rights were the common constitutional tradition, it's not obvious that the common constitutional tradition includes the right to private property as a fundamental right. So, in purely legal dogmatic terms, we could say there is a problem with this. Moreover, the understanding of economic freedoms that the European Court of Justice has been putting forward since the 80s is one that has extended the understanding of one economic freedom, that is the free movement of goods, to the other economic freedoms. And this is something that playing the very, if you want, provincial lawyer, you can see that there is a problem here, because the structure of the treaties clearly says that the legislator did not intend to collapse them. There is one chapter on free movement of goods, one chapter on agriculture, and another chapter on the other three economic freedoms. Why the difference? And this has to do with a certain understanding of the systematic position of the freedoms and what they were supposed to be. Of a certain understanding, if you wish, I have to hurry because of the time, of a certain understanding of the socio-economic structure in which goods move, but then there are restrictions that are much more possible regarding other economic freedoms. This is the post-war embedded liberalism, if we want to use for a second political, political economic terms. The collapsing of all freedoms into the model of free movement of goods is the work of the European Court of Justice. It's not something that was decided first by the legislator. The legislator acted in a way as codifier of what the European Court of Justice had decided. Now, the model that is common is from the uh, 80s, basically from Cassidy Dijon, uh, this famous decision that all of you that are studying European law sooner or later have to come to, is an understanding, moreover, in which the European Court of Justice stopped understanding economic freedoms as operationalization of non-discrimination and started to understand them as self-standing principles. But this is huge in constitutional terms, because this means that not only states have to treat non-national economic actors or goods or services in the same way that they treat national ones, but they have to start to treat them according to a standard that, in practice, is defined by the European Court of Justice. Hmm? But this is, again, something that is not on the basis of the treaties. This is something based on the understanding of the European Court of Justice. Now, a fourth argument that can be added is that the moment in which the Charter of Rights is part of European law, there is no reason why you have to consider that the canon of constitutionality has to be limited to economic freedoms. The argument, technically speaking, again, it's in the paper, uh, I cannot uh, explain it in detail, the argument that the European Court of Justice was using was that economic freedoms had direct effect. Hmm? Therefore, there were candidates in order to be used as canon of constitutionality. Now, this kind of argument could be extended or in ways that I will come back in a second, be used in order to change the way in which the European Court of Justice operates. So, first leg of the argument, I'm far from convinced about the understanding of the canon of constitutionality. 
The canon of constitutionality is very different from the canon of constitutionality in post-war democratic constitutions, which were not about unleashing the right to private property and entrepreneurial freedom, but was about, if you want to summarize, the social function of private property, so to say. Very different world in normative terms. The second part regards the use of proportionality. And here, there are three very short points that have to be made. The one has to do with the burden of argumentation. And this is something that anybody that has read some rulings of the European Court of Justice would realize. It is always that the European Court of Justice starts by granting the burden of argumentation to the state that tries to justify a measure against an economic freedom. The court always starts, and the understanding of economic freedom is so large, and the con conditions under which it will be relevant are so extensive, that it is always a matter of economic freedom. Mm -hmm. There are very few things that will be excluded. So illegal activities are covered by economic freedoms. For example, even uh, the intentional purpose of avoidance of taxes is part of free movement of capital. Then it could be justified to try to avoid it, but it's part of the definition of economic freedom. This means that you always start the ruling, the, uh, sorry, the discussion on the basis of trying to justify limiting economic freedom. But why is this so? Why it could not be that we would come to the conclusion that the center of gravity of the argument uh, of the case is a different one? To make an example that is familiar to you for existential reasons, Viking, which was about the ferries coming to Estonia, uh, why is it that we have to understand that the center of gravity of the case is freedom of establishment and is not the rights of workers? And it makes a difference who has the argumentative burden. But the European Court of Justice, contrary to national constitutional courts, always starts the problem, always defines the problem in the same way. As I was saying, now that the Charter is part of the positive law of the European Union, there is no real justification for doing that in legal dogmatic terms. I don't find it very persuasive. Second problem is that the fundamental positions at the stake are always understood under the prism of the right to private property and entrepreneurial freedom. And my favorite case there is a series of judgments on the coherence of tax systems that has to do with issues that have been with us very well before the Lux leaks and the Panama Papers, just to refer to things that are in the media, seeing that uh, I'm not good in rhetorics and I see many people already so, say Panama Papers in order to see if you wake up. But uh, the, the question is that the European Court of Justice has been using uh, this argument of coherence of the tax system that seems to be opening the way for national authorities justifying anti-avoidance measures. Okay, the problem is the following. How does it understand coherence of the tax system? When we talk about the tax system, we understand the tax system as coherent if the whole set of taxes is able to achieve certain constitutional goals, like progressiveness, for example, of the tax system. The European Court of Justice defines coherence of the tax system as the commutative equivalence, in a way, of taxes for the same taxpayer. So, in very simple terms, while national tax laws understand the redistributive element in tax law, the European Court of Justice reduces tax law to a matter of commutative justice for the individual taxpayer. The same goes again with biking. The understanding, and Leo has written extensively of, of, on this, the understanding of the right to strike, independently of what you think about the ruling, the understanding that you have to exercise the right to strike in a proportionate manner, is something that does not take seriously what the right to strike is about. The right to strike in labor law is about rebalancing the position between the weak part, which is the workers, and the strong part, which is the employers. If you have to exercise the right to strike in a way that is proportional to the interests of the employers, 
You can't strike efficiently. Hmm? You cannot be effective in your strike. But this reveals that the European Court of Justice is pushing into the normative framework of the right to private property and the production as understood by the court all other potential fundamental positions, which is, again, problematic. Last point is that there are different standards of evidence which are applied to economic freedoms and to other type of fundamental positions. So if you are arguing in favor of economic freedoms, it's very easy to prove, as I was saying, because it's always that there is a breach. If you are arguing about the effectiveness, about the necessity in terms of the proportionality um, the structure, that there are no alternative means by, by means of which you can solve the conflict that are less uh, aggressive in a way regarding the economic freedom, the standard of evidence is much higher. Hmm? So, in some ways, in a ridiculous manner. So, in many rulings, the European Court of Justice has changed a bit track, but especially in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, the understanding of how states can pursue certain policy goals was a very, a very strange one. There is a wonderful case, Schwartz, uh, of a German parents uh, that uh, send their, their children uh, to uh, a Scottish public school very expensive Scottish public school that uh, was closed by the authorities, by the British authorities, because they were, it was unhealthy, they were scolding people. You know, there was the standard British public school. So it was very bad environment, cold, uh, bad meals, and uh, then there was lots of uh, corporal punishment uh, for children. So it was closed. But the proceedings had started, and they wanted to claim tax deduction uh, uh, on the same position as other German parents sending to German schools they could, and the uh, German authorities were claiming, well, we cannot give that because we cannot give it to people sending uh, children every, anywhere in the world. There is limits to what we can control about the quality of the schools. And then the European Court of Justice goes into a tirade about the problem. The German authorities could do this and could do that. You know, the standard of evidence is very different in one case or the other. It's a very entertaining case. You should read it. On this basis, and I compress the argument perhaps to the point of being completely difficult to understand and follow. On this basis, I think there is a very strong argument to say that there is a big difference between the way in which the European Court of Justice and national constitutional courts go about business in terms of the canon of constitutionality and in terms of how they apply proportionality. So, on such a basis, what are the lessons, in a way, of trying to apply proportionality to European law? And I think, regarding proportionality, as I was saying, there is, and this, if you start scratching in the European legal scholarship, I think this is very obvious, there is a misunderstanding of proportionality. Proportionality is not only understood as a principle of positive law, not as a structure of practical reasoning, and is supposed to have been imported from German law, not taking into account that it is a structure of practical reason, this has not been imported from anywhere. It's a structure, there's a syntax in a way that was there. But it's also understood as a legitimizing strategy, as I was saying. You follow proportionality, your decision is right. As I pointed at the beginning, I think this is not a proper understanding of proportionality. It can be extremely useful in order to reveal how proportionality then is filled. So there is an element of discipline that results from following proportionality. But in terms of the concrete, each concrete decision, I think very obviously, the justice, the correctness, whatever standard you want to use, either of positive law or of, of morality from the point of view of proportionality, depends on how you feel the principle of proportionality, depends on the decisions that you take regarding the concrete principles. In this sense, is something that is not relevant for the judges, but is relevant for the citizens as addressees of, of the decision of the judges. It can be an alternative use of proportionality, if you allow me to use an expression that used to be uh, employed some time ago. If we don't do that, as I was saying, but we persist in claiming that if you follow the steps, then the result is correct, instead, of being an element, as Professor Alexi was saying this morning, of putting order into chaos, is a matter of cloaking arbitrariness. 
because it gives the impression of rationality to something that is based not on rational arguments but is based on raw power. The second question, uh, I think, is that there is a risk of creating a tool of escaping law. It could be used, and I think the European Court of Justice has in many occasions used it, as a way of escaping from law. Because, and Viking again is a very good example, there is, and I think this is pure uh, theory of, of constitutional rights in many ways, uh, the fact that you use proportionality does not mean that you do not take into, into account the thickness of previous decisions, which must be taken into account, uh, because you have to take into account precedent. Very especially, you have to take into account legislative decisions, also national constitutional norms. And moreover, the principle of the social democratic Reichstag, so to say, at the core of the um, post-war democratic European constitutional tradition is not only an enumeration of rights, it's not only that we have the democratic state, the Reichstag and the social state, is that we understand all these rights as rights that have to be reconciled, as three aspirations that have to be reconciled into an integral whole that comes with a very concrete institutional mechanism. So, for example, to bring us back to the blues of the Eurozone crisis, the understanding that the European Court of Justice has in Prindle, which is a terribly bad judgment, by the way, in many ways, terribly bad, with strange reviews being written about the judgment, by the way, which look more like CVs for becoming judges at the European Court of Justice <laughs> than serious um, legal scholarship uh, works. In Pringle, the European Court of Justice comes to the conclusion that is absolutely normal that states have in their issuing debt to be subject to the rules of the market. That therefore, that debt, public debt, is another financial asset, is an ordinary financial asset at the end of the day. This is something that is extremely problematic from the point of view of the social democratic Rechstadt. Implies a different state, a different relation between the individual and the community. It implies many things. This specific thing that seems so technical is something that is anathema to a certain understanding of the state that was being affirmed democratically in democratic constitutions in the post-war. Proportionality in a context in which there is not a thick layer of previous decisions, institutional mechanism, and this kind of stuff, can be understood as a way that we can replay the game from scratch, in a way. That we have these rights here, we have to balance them, and we can avoid, in a way, the thickness of the previous decisions and the institutional design that is very much related to the way of how we reconcile the three uh, different elements. To conclude, in the last minute, uh, on the nature of European law. I think uh, that this, as I was saying, is very much related to the kind of a state that the European Union is. Only two very small reflections. First is that we have to face that the European Union is by now a state. All, these, all the discussions about whether it's a state or not are now over, even in a Bavarian sense. The European Union has the power of life and death over states and banks from a financial perspective. The European stability mechanism is the lender of last resort of sovereigns, and the European Central Bank is the lender of last resort of banks. And there is a European border guard. There is a European police by now. So this means control over money and control over territory. This is a state. The question is that it's a very peculiar state. It's a very twisted state. It's a state that I would say has many problematic features. There are the inklings, and more than the inklings, on, of an authoritarian European state. This is not exactly reassuring, as the concluding words of a presentation at 5.20, but I'm afraid that I have no other words. Thanks.